morning, we're talking with Dr. Tim Hurd regarding Australian native bees. This is part of a series of uh, interviews and discussions just to look at how to maintain and look after our natural resource of Australian native bees. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Glenn. Tim, 30 years, and, and let me say you're a, an entomologist, a research scientist, and you've been doing it for 30 years. Tell me about uh, some of those years and what you've found with our natural resource of Australian native bees. Well, it's been a long journey for me. Um, how do I summarise that? Um, I guess, um, like many people, these bees are just so engaging, they're so enthralling. When you first see them, you kind of, they just get into your brain and you can't really let them go. They, they really are an amazing, they have this amazing ability to attract people. And I felt that, actually I remember feeling it when I was at high school and I first saw them, so that's going well back more than 30 years. But um, I did start keeping them about 35 years ago. Um, and uh, I've, never, I've never given up. In fact, I've been steadily increasing numbers over that whole period. Um, I started with carbonara. That's all it was in Brisbane back then, I believe. Um, so that's, that's an interesting observation over that time, how we have seen the movement of, of at least one species, TH, Tetragon yellow hocking's eye, uh, down the east coast of Australia from north of Brisbane, where it was, um, its most southerly limit was north of Brisbane, to now it's well down um, south of Brisbane. So that's an interesting um, occurrence, whether that's because of warming climate or whether it's because of uh, human movement of hives. Um, we, we're not quite sure, probably a mixture of both. Probably the warming climate has allowed it and bees moving, uh, sorry, people moving the hives has, has sped it up. Um, but just going back um, to, to 30 years ago, um, I was keeping Carbonaria. I've always kept a few Australis as well, but because I live on the coast, they don't do all that well for me. So it's been more, I've been very, very Carbonaria focused over all those years. I have seen a change. I've seen many changes. I've seen changes, uh, obviously, first in the popularity of these bees. It's just been this, steady, um, relentless, really, uh, increase. It seems like every year there's twice as many people keep interested in, in the bees and keeping them as the year before. So that's, that, and that shows no sign of stopping. It doesn't seem like a fad to me. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like a fad in the sense that there's like, there's this peak of popularity that will then pass. It just seems to be all up over, over decades. So, I think, and you know, that relates to how I, what I first started saying that they are so engaging. And once you do start keeping these pieces, it's almost like a an addictive habit. It, you just can't let it go. Uh, a good addiction, of course. Yeah, and a healthy addiction. <laughs> exactly. Now, actually, actually, your your, your word infectious um, resonates with me because just quickly, my background was uh, I I started. Um, my road down the uh, the track with uh, Australian native bees with my sister who who had a hive and uh, this was only early this year and I'm only, I'm only a newbie and the infectious nature of a natural resource operating as it does as you've said it's it just has an attraction and of its own um, you've and I might say at the end of the, the video too um, I, I bought your book and everyone who deals with Australian native bees should buy that it's a wonderful resource on exactly how to and what to do. Uh, and that must have taken some time to put together, Tim. Well, uh, the book is nearly five years old now. Uh, so five years ago, I was writing that book. Um, and uh, it did take some time. But in fact, because I've been giving workshops for many years, it really just grew from the workshops. So it was kind of just um, getting most of that book down was just a brain dump, just I've been thinking about um, writing a book for some years, but um, my friend Glenbo Craig, um, who's in the book industry or was in the book industry, uh, uh, encouraged me to do it. And and I, you know, I came up with all these excuses. Oh yeah, but you know, 
what level do I pitch it at and what do I include and what do I exclude and, and uh, et cetera. And he said, look, just write down your workshop, just your workshop from start to finish is a book. And uh, I realized he was, he was right. That would be, that would be a good strategy for writing the book. So I basically just sat down, took a couple of months and I just dumped everything. I just thought, well, what am I doing? I'm presenting a workshop. I'm just going to put that my words, my spoken words in the written words. So that happened pretty quick, but then it is a long process of, um, collecting all the images and tidying it all up and getting experts. All the chapters were checked by experts, um, getting all the permissions um, and, and then designing it. And so that was all by Glenn, but I mean, it, one, the, the book looks great, not, not through any effort of mine, but through that of, um, of Glenn Bogue. Uh, he's he's yep. a well-known guy in the Navy B industry as well, um, based in, in Gympie. And yeah, he's just got this amazing ability to to make books, writing, text look beautiful. So yeah, got to got to got to give him a uh, um, uh, a call out there. Give him a um, But yeah, it did take some time, but um, it was a labour of love. It was uh, it was a real pleasure to write, and um, and um, yeah, and it's been well received. So I think it was worthwhile. Yeah. What well, one thing that I have noticed, and and certainly your book talks about it, there are some general principles that everyone should follow when they're looking after native bees as a natural resource. But what I found was that those general principles were enacted by different people, different ways. Everyone seemed to be having, yeah, that, that's the way to do it, but this is the way I do it. Um, what, in your opinion, Within Southeast Queensland, and as I said, we talked to Graham Sanders in North Queensland. Southeast Queensland, what are the, the bees that thrive? I mean, we, I've got AAs, uh, Australis, um, Ostropedia Australis, and I've got TCs and THs, but it, it seems they all do different things. Your recommendation for keeping bees in Southeast Queensland? Well, Carbonaria are fantastic, but Hockingside are great as well. They both do very well. If you are west of the range, uh, so that excludes most people, the population, human populations thin, obviously, as you go west. Um, but if you do happen to be lucky enough to live west of the range, where it's, I believe, uh, humidity is the, the driving factor to explain that this distribution, um, where the humidity is lower than Australis do very well. So um, there are a number of people on the Darling Downs, for example, and, and other parts of inland Queensland uh, who keep Australis. And it's very close relative as you go further north, Cassiae. So they're two species of Australopithecia. So I'll take a step back here and say that we do have these two, what, what are technically called genera, uh, so a singular genus, plural genera, we have these two genera, which are broad groupings of stingless bees. So the Ostroplebeas, we can shorten that to the Ostros and the Tetragonulas, which we could shorten to Tetras. Now the Ostros, these two species I've just mentioned, Australis and Cassiae, uh, uh, do very well in inland Australia. And in fact, they go very well in that hundreds and hundreds of kilometers from the coast, almost as, in the case of Australia, to central Australia in some very wet areas. Uh, I should say some areas where there's some oasis type areas. Mm. So they love the dry, the, the dry conditions. On the coast, they don't do so well and it is m much harder to keep them. I think I've got about 16 hives and I've been building up for, for decades. So. Australis is a bit of a struggle. Um, Carbonaria and Hocking's eye. So they're the two species of Tetragonula. They're very similar species in many ways. Um, many aspects of their, their biology and their keeping are similar. Um, they do very well on the coast. Um, so in southern Queensland, Carbonaria, uh, in uh, all, all of Queensland, really, Hocking's eye. So um, Carbonaria is, I think, a particularly beautiful species when you open a hive and you see its spiraling brood architecture. It's just breathtakingly stunning. Mm. Um, Hocking's eye is 
possibly a slightly stronger species and is capable of producing a little more honey. Um, it's capable of building slightly bigger nest sizes, so more individuals, bigger volumes, and more honey. So those two species, I think, are just fantastic for coastal southeast Queensland. Graham Sanders talked about two versions of Hawkins Eye, a northern and a southern. Do you have a view on that? Well, there's good evidence that that is the case. Um, I don't think they're different species. I think they're just the one species that genetically the difference between them is is minor, but it exists. There is a difference. Um, you, you can you can uh, categorise just based. If you, you can just get a, a sample of these bees and analyse, fingerprint the DNA, and you can tell from that analysis whether they're from North Queensland and South Queensland. The cutoff is Mackay. Mackay has the southern ones, but if you go further north of that, then um, the northern ones kick in. Now, as to whether they're different to keep, I can't really comment because I've only kept the southern ones. Yeah. And I haven't really traveled. I, I have done some beekeeping in North Queensland. I've traveled to, um, to Townsville on several occasions. Um, that's the only location I've worked in north of Mackay. And I have worked with the Northern Hocking Eye. Based on that limited experience, I didn't really note any major difference in their biology, but Graham has worked with them. I don't know what he's done, how much work he's done with the southern species, but there's a lot written about the southern species. And on the basis, I, I assume in the case of Graham, on the basis of his experience with the northern ones, compared to what he's read about the southern ones, he's, um, he believes there are some, some strong differences. Sure. And and I and I don't doubt that um, he he could well be true. I just don't have the experience to say that it's definitely right. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess the other point I would make there is sometimes the same organism will behave differently in different environments. Sure. So the North Queensland environment is clearly very, very different from South Queensland. In particular, I mean it's obviously warmer. Um, but also the seasonality of rainfall is much greater. So in southern Queensland, we're just having good rain instead of winter. It would be very rare to have good rain in uh, Townsville in the yep. middle of winter. So the seasonality of rainfall up there, the distinction between the wet, hot summer and the dry, warm winter is, is much more pronounced. So maybe it's, it's a climatic thing as well as a um, due to the bees themselves. Yeah. and or an interaction between the climate and the bees. Sure. Well, I can certainly vouch for you, uh, what you're saying about the species. Hawkins Eye, in my experience, are, are a more aggressive bee. Um, Australis, they certainly, I think someone's termed as being hippie bees. Um, <laughs> and I've, they, they, they react to the temperature variances. As you've talked about, the Australis just won't come out until 21, 22, uh, whereas the, the Hawkins Eye and the Carbonaria at that 18 degrees. And, and it's not too far away from that that they actually start to interact. But let's, let's just delve a little bit deeper into, let's say, hive construction now. Uh, as I talked uh, with Graham, he was very much in line with hardwood. Your hives, uh, is it fair to say generally they're of, of softwood nature? Just take us through yeah, your absolutely. hives. Absolutely. I used hoop pine, good quality, A-grade, kiln-dried hoop pine, um, 25 mil thick. So uh, that's an excellent insulating material. Hoop pine's got a lot of great things about it. Uh, it does have this one big negative that it is not durable in exterior conditions. Hives are normally kept in exterior conditions, so there is a bit of a, um, a trade-off there. I'm trading off the benefits of hoop pine to this big disadvantage of them uh, of it uh, of the potential for the box to rot, the wood to rot uh, if it's if it gets wet. So yeah, if you do use hoop pine, very important to keep. Um, to keep it dry, basically, to keep it well, keep the wood dry. So how do you keep wood dry? Um, you keep it well painted, you keep it raised above the ground, 
uh, and you keep a metal roof or some kind of roof over the top of it or you put it under an eave or you protect it somehow from the rain. If you do that, if you keep hoop pine dry, it will last many, many years. If you put it out in the rain and it's not properly protected, not painted, it will deteriorate very quickly. So you do have to look after the boxes, but it, I, th I believe it's an excellent material. Materials around. Um, but you t you're just seeing a massive increase in price. So price is, is, a, is a factor. I mean, um, if you've got one hive, and I guess, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the discussions around um, pros and cons of keeping native bees going, I think they, they do come down to price and that interacts with, with the sort of numbers of hives that you're managing. So if you've got two hives in your backyard, and you're looking at building two more boxes to, to propagate those hives, then the cost of the material is not a big deal. But when you've got 500 hives and you have to multiply those, you don't have to, but you're, you're running a business and it's, you're multiplying those hives every year, basically producing 500 new hives every year, which is what we do, then uh, obviously cost is very important. So, um, and, and I think that applies to a whole bunch of, of these arguments that um, people have about uh, many aspects of keeping bees. It boils down to how many bees, how many hives you're managing and mm. what you might do as, a, um, as an enthusiast with a small number of hives makes very good sense in that situation. But then what you might do as a professional beekeeper uh, managing a lot of hives, a different practice may make much more sense. Neither's right, neither's wrong, um, they're just difference they're just horses for courses yeah and it's an important point too that you make tim that the bees are going to live in these hives for upwards of 25 30 years aren't they so they have to be durable the boxes do need to be durable because the bees do live for very very long time they i mean the bees can live indefinitely mm. um but you're probably right that 20 year mark uh we do experience about a five percent natural mortality Year. So if you're running a hundred hives, you'll typically get about five hives to die out for one reason or another. Uh, a lot of beekeepers observe that that's similar numbers, and I think honey beekeepers probably observe similar numbers to that as well. So what that means is that yes, um, the expected life of the hive is around about 20 years. Uh, so you certainly don't want the box to deteriorate within that time. If you do keep honeybees, it's relatively simple to move the bee colony out of a rotten box into a new box. You just got to lift the frames straight out one box into the next. With stingless bees, it is more difficult. Um, and it can be quite a challenge, but it's not as difficult as some people maintain. If you are an experienced beekeeper, it's really not that difficult to uh, to move a, a colony from a, a rotten box um, into a into a, a new box. Uh, in fact, I've got one in my front yard that's rotten. It's not one of our boxes, but it's a box that we obtained and it's rotten and it's we've got to move the bees out. Yep. I I, kind of, I find it quite an interesting process to be honest. I, you know, you really get to see a hive, every aspect of a hive. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's not something you really want to be doing often and it's not something you want to be doing if you don't have good experience with handling the bees. Yeah. Um, it's often talked about the temperature inside a hive. Um, it, to me, it's that part of the, the keeping of the, the hive is fairly important because, uh, and as I've seen even with my hives now, even as a newbie, that going through winter, they need plenty of stores, they need a good solid box that maintains uh, the temperature inside. Is that the case? Is, is temperature that important inside the hive? Oh, absolutely, it is. There's, there's, no, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and insulation is a very important aspect of temperature. So wood thickness. So wood thickness is, you know, is something that gets discussed a lot. So I, I, I you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that. Um, but ins insulation is um, is very, very important. But only really works if you've got, I mean, if you've got a house and you've got very good insulation in the walls, 
uh, that will keep the house. That will that will help you to maintain the temperatures in the house. I'm talking about a house for humans now. Your yep. our own homes. But you really need to combine that if you want to live in comfortable conditions all year round. You really need to combine it with heating and cooling as well. Yep. So you know we have heating and cooling. Many people have heating and cooling in our homes, and that definitely you know insulation can only get you so far. If you've got an average temperature outside of below zero and a long winter, and you don't have any heating, it doesn't matter how well insulated your house is, it's going to get below eventually the temperature inside the house is going to drop to below zero the kind of an average of what the external temperatures are so we avoid that by warming the house inside and insulation helps to keep that warmth in bees are the same they can warm the house inside through their metabolic heat you've got you know 10,000 bees sitting in this eight or so uh, liter volume they're all generating heat and uh, acting as little heaters and, and warming that temperature and they're holding that temperature in. So how, um, the population of your box is an important factor as well as the insulation. Um, the, the position of the box is also important. If it can get some external warmth in, uh, in winter, then that's fantastic. In Queensland, we're fortunate. We generally have nice sunny days in winter. So, um, if you can position your box so that it's picking up that warm sun, um, it's meaning the air in, around the hive, the entrance is warm, that allows the bees to get flying. That air reaches a, uh, a flying temperature quicker, but it also means that warmth on the box will penetrate eventually and warm the box up too. So, positioning. Um, so, where am I positioning the? the the strength of the colony inside the box and the insulation abilities of the box. I think all of those three things interact um, to ensure that the bees are active. Now, if stingless bees, if the temperature in the box does drop below 18, you mentioned before that magical figure of 18, when we're talking about Hocking's eye and Carbonaria, that's when they get active outside the box. It's the same inside the box. If it gets below 18 in there, they stop. They just don't move anymore. They're, they're just fixed in position. And um, that's not a good place to be. Um, you can't defend the colony. You can't re-brood. You can't feed yourself. You can't feed the queen. Everything's sort of frozen in time. They will actually uh, survive um, in that state for, for many, many days, even weeks. So Tim, in this video, I, I've just got a couple of questions. I've been told that a, a queenless hive will produce this sort of structure, which is the, the uh, like web structure there. Is that the case if it's not a queen in the hive? Uh, well, a queenless hive, will, the bees will keep working. Um, they don't lose that drive to work. And they'll, they'll continue to build all sorts of structures. Um, I've, I, I opened a hive last week. Um, well, I should say my, my assistant opened a hive last week and it, um, it ha was very strong, full of food, completely queenless, broodless. So the bees had presumably the queen had died some time back, all the brood had hatched. They just kept on working and they had built um, a huge hive up, but it had no, its, it's destiny was very, look, it was very grim. It had no future because it seemed to be hopelessly queenless. So they will certainly keep working and building all sorts of structures, still keep foraging, collecting food. Um, but um, yeah, their, 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 their fate is probably uh, sealed. Tim, your views on, I take it that um, with the design of your hives, you've got uh, horizontal split hives. What's your views on vertical split hives? Uh, I don't use, I only had one vertical split. Uh, well, I had two. Um, one's, um, I've only got one at the moment. Um, if they're interesting, I think they don't work well for Carbonara because Carbonara naturally has these horizontal layers and why cut through and kill bees in their cells when you can just separate between uh, separate this between the layers and, and and so you don't kill any 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 brood in the process of splitting. Um, 
With vertical splitting, I think in, the death of some brood is inevitable because you physically have to cut down through the brood and cut through a number of brood cells. I don't think that's necessarily um, a bad thing. I take the attitude that if you have a beekeeping technique that results in very successful propagation of colonies and that technique um, results in the death of some individual bees, I look at the bigger picture and say, you're successfully breeding colonies. Those colonies are breeding a lot of individual bees. Um, the death of a few individual breed bees for the sake of the colony can often be justified. So from that point of view, I'm not criticizing vertical splitting. Now for um, the, uh, in Hawking's eyes well, I think vertical splitting, not such a great idea because you do have an advance in front in Hawking's eye. You don't have nice flat layers of comb, but you do have an advance in front. When you split a hive horizontally, it will often split into a top and a bottom section at the advance in front. So again, no death of any bees in cells whatsoever. Um, with Australis, on the other hand, I think vertical splitting um, and horizontal splitting are really pretty similar. I mean, what you're achieving, what you so it, just going back to the brood structure of both of, of both species, of all species of, of the Australis, is that it's a sphere that basically where the brood starts to be built in the middle, expands outwards. When it reaches the outside, the involucrum, it goes back into the middle and starts forming again from the middle where a space has formed from the emergence of the original brood. So it's this, it's like an expanding universe in there, constantly expanding and going back to the center and starting again. So really, it doesn't matter how you cut a structure like that, it's pretty equal. It's, it's symmetrical in all planes. Hmm. So vertical or horizontal, I think it's, it's, it's very similar. So um, certainly for Australopithecia, it's, it's, it's just as good, I think, as, um, as horizontal. But I think the, 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 the fundamental design um, principle of a, of, a, of, two horizontal, of a horizontal hive design where one, one box sits on top of the other has this advantage that gravity is working for you. That box on top is going to be always pushing down on the box below and keeping those boxes together. As soon as you've got vertical boxes one beside the other, it only takes a slight movement in the foundations of one of those eyes and you'll get natural splitting um, and a gap forming between those boxes. That would be, that's my major concern with vertical split eyes. Yep. People get around it yep. uh, in various ways, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a great fan, although I certainly respect that, the opinion of those who, who do practice it. Yep. So Tim, talking about splitting hives, uh, as I understand it, there's a couple of issues with some of the, the reasons why hives fail when they're split. Just run us through some of those things. For instance, honey, spillage, uh, hive strength and the like. Yeah, sure. So I, th I believe the failure to requeen is the number one factor. So in my experience, you split a hive and in um, 19 times out of 20, 95% of the, of the cases, then both halves survive. But in about 5% of cases, one in 20, one of the halves will die. And that's, and they usually die at about eight months, six to eight months. And if you open them up and look inside, then usually there's little or no brood um, or the brood's very old. And so that indicates to me that, that hive has failed to requeen. And uh, that I believe is at least half of the cases where a hive dies out. So that's a big issue. Now these bees um, do have backup mechanisms of requeening, but some clearly the backup mechanisms also fail in some cases. So that's number one for me, I believe. I guess pests is another one. And you mentioned spilt honey. Um, spilt honey is definitely an issue, but that's in relationship to pests. Spilt honey in itself is probably not a big deal. I mean, a catastrophic amount, a huge amount of spilt honey could be a big deal. The bees could drown in it and you could get 
the whole thing going off, fungal growth, etc. But generally, uh, it's pests that move in uh, to a weaker hive after a split and get going. They, they start breeding. Uh, they lay their eggs and the eggs hatch and the larvae start breeding in that spilt honey. And that leads to a, a massive pest infestation and that can kill the hive too. Particularly uh, forehead fly, but also surfed fly and small hive beetle. They're the three big ones. Um, black soldier fly is another one, but it's pretty minor. Um, native hive beetle is also pretty minor. So I, I believe there's a few, that I don't believe that happens very much to me. I, I don't suffer from a lot of pests and I, and I sometimes scratch my head and ask myself, what am I doing right? You know, I mean, you, you develop experience with the years mm -hmm. and you start doing things that clearly work for you. Um, and then years later to say, well, you know, someone else is having a problem. What are they, what am I doing right that avoids that problem? And it, I, I can't really put my finger on it, but I think it's probably a few things. I think, Number one is only split when a hive is strong. Mm -hmm. So uh, you should have about an eight liter hive box, six to eight liters. It should be full. It should be full of food and brood in each, each half um, before you progress with the split. Um, and, and number two, you, the entrance needs to be reduced in size for that period after a split it could be even completely closed it wouldn't hurt at all to completely close the entrance for at least a few days for the bees to tidy up inside before you allow the the exit of the bees and the potential entry also of pests so we use a propolis ring to do that but there are other ways of doing of achieving the same thing um I, yeah i i think that's that's Probably the to, to me they're the two big the big ones only splitting a full hive, strong hive, and um, and closing down the the entrance in some sort of way. Yep. People talk a lot about time of year. Some people talk about how you should only split uh, in spring when there's abundant spring and or summer when there's an abundant amount of food reserves in the environment. That should not be a consideration. Because if you're splitting a hive when the hive is strong, then that hive should have at least one kilo, better two kilos of stored resources in each half. Mm. So that, that is tons of food for the bees. They can live on their reserves for probably three months. They don't need to be bringing in fresh food. In fact, having a lot of food available in the environment that's distracting some of the bees and maybe um, motivating, stimulating, uh, foraging could be, even be a negative thing because it's taking the workforce away from the most important thing that they should be doing after a hive split, and that is repairing the damage in the hive. Mm. You're pulling those bees away to forage for food that they don't actually need right now uh, when they could be storing, uh, repairing the, the hive is a negative thing. So. Uh, I know people who split in the middle of winter. We avoid the coldest days of winter, but we split the whole year round and winter's just as successful as, as summer hmm. in Southeast Queensland. I certainly do not recommend you split in winter in colder climates, be they more Southern climates or even Western climates where the, the nights are much cooler, that can be a risk. But in Southeast Queensland or all of Queensland, uh, all of coastal Queensland, then uh, you can, I believe you can split pretty much the whole year round. And um, yeah, as long as the hive is, is, um, has got great reserves of food and large bee populations too. So a strong hive should also, so when I say strong, I mean large reserves of food and also a very good population of bees. So you need those bees after a split, you need those bees to repair any damage, get that hole, um, the entrance behind the hole repaired, uh, any spilled honey cleaned up, any broken honey pots cleaned up, any bees that have been dislodged from their pots taken outside. Guards quickly posted around the entrance. So good worker population, good amounts of stored food combined uh, with a some way of preventing, uh, keeping that entry, entrance protected are the keys, yep. I, I believe.
let's let's talk about rescues now they can be out of a natural environment and they can be out of a let's say a water meter which obviously these days provides plenty of insulation so because they're in the ground like so and there's various ways of doing that as well but your interpretation of the ideal way to transfer from either a water meter or a natural environment into a man-made environment. Just step us through that. Sure. Could I just make one point first, Glenn? And there's a difference between um, a rescue um, and and taking uh, bees out of a perfectly good log. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to present my philosophical point of view um, and you know again I'm, I'm not telling anybody what to do but personally I don't like removing bees out of good solid logs I think it's I think it's um, you know it's not in the best interest of the bees if you've got them in a good solid log and that log is providing a good home for them leave it for them um, don't try and get them out you can try and bud them off or duck them out by all means but don't split logs open to to take bees out that's just not in the best interest of bees we i see them dying all the time as a result of that and even when they don't die you know they set it sets them back a long time and you know why what are you actually trying to achieve you've got a you've got the bees um very well um homed so leave them in their home so that's one point but um, go, so go, so I'll focus more on um, rescues, true yep. rescues. Where these have to be. So a log's been taken, a log's, uh, a tree's fallen down in the storm, smashed open. You've got to get the bees into a new home. The bees have um, colonised the water meter box. They can't remain there. That's um, you know, obviously they've got to be moved from that situation. They're a pest when they're in that situation. You've got to transfer them out. That's a true rescue. So I think the keys to rescues um, are that um, it's, it's, it's all about B numbers. Um, it's not all about B numbers, but B numbers are the number one consideration. So you've got to get all the brood and you've got to try and get the brood out in as good a condition as possible, but you've also got to get those workers. So there's a number of ways of achieving that. Um, but then there's the, the food. How much stored food do you put in? And some people will say none at all. You're just asking for trouble if you take any food, um, particularly if it's in poor condition. But even if it's in you know pretty good condition, taking any food stores, pots of pollen and honey, and putting them in, transferring them from the, let's say, a water meter box or a broken log into a, a new hive um, is a bad idea because it'll immediately, that hive is vulnerable, it, it's, it's, its entrances um, uh, are not guarded, pests can come in, spilt honey, broken pollen pots, they'll quickly, um, the pests will quickly colonise those resources and then they'll breed and they'll destroy the box. Uh, I do tend to move some food over under certain circumstances, particularly if that food uh, is um, has got a lot of bees on it. So that's a way of getting the bees in as, as much as getting the food in. But it, it, people are right. It's very important not to put too much broken food pot in that hive. Um, you do need a hole in the bottom. You need a drainage hole. Now, I, my standard hives don't have a drainage hole in the bottom. But if I'm doing a transfer into a hive, always drill a hole to allow any drainage. I also put a, a, an extra floor, a floor made of bird wire in the bottom of that box. And I, I, I ensure that the, that floor is, is um, higher than the wooden floor of the box. So that when I place hive materials, brood, food, connectives, in that box, it's sitting on that, um, on that structure, that, that wire. Any spilled honey can drip through and then it can drain out through the drainage hole. You make sure the drainage hole is at the lowest point. So you tilt the box so the corner, I usually put it in a corner and I have the diagonally opposite corner at the highest point so any honey can drain out. I put a container outside that uh, hole, uh, under that hole for the first 24 hours to capture any honey so I can take it away. It's not, you haven't got spilled honey dropping onto the soil around the hive so that will attract natural enemies. So um, getting your box all prepared with that, a hole in the bottom, wire floor, entry. You've got to close that entry right down. It 
only needs a tiny. So again, we use a propolis ring for that. Mm -hmm. You can block any ventilation holes altogether. So there's very limited opportunities for pests to get in and the bees, the bees really only need the tiniest of entries at that point. Um, so, uh, and then I guess the final, or I guess one other thing is only give them the volume that they need at that point. So if you've got a three part box and you can get all the material into the first box and you put some kind of blanking plate, the uh, best thing to use is a, um, a screen of plastic, a sheet of plastic, yep. and then cover that over so that you can lift the cover off and have a look and see how they're going. I say what we're looking at by doing it with just one section is temperature control. Yeah, temperature control. Um, basically, uh, your the bees can focus on, yeah, they've got a, a, a third or much smaller volume to thermoregulate, to control the temperature inside. But I suppose it also includes natural enemies as well. There's fewer volume of space where natural enemies can escape uh, from um, patrolling bees. Mm. But yeah, I, I think you're right. Temperature control is number one there. If they can fit in two boxes, then you give them two boxes. If they need all three, you give them all three. Yep. I guess the third and final thing is you've got to try and capture as many bees, adult bees, from the old uh, site as possible. And uh, there's two basic ways of achieving that. One is you position the box where the entrance hole was. And you put some propolis around the entrance of the box so that the bees are focused. The bees are very focused on a particular position where the hive entry was. They've learnt that position. They they seem to kind of triangulate from various visual cues, objects around the hive, and they know they'll go straight back to where the hive. Is. So for a lot, you can see you can you can see this yourself. That if, um, if you move bees out of a log where the entrance was, they'll be going back to. So you you put your box entry in that same place, um, or you can use a bee vac and or use a bee vac which enables you to collect up any bees. It's a very time consuming process and it means that you, you know, you've got to stay at the site where the bees were for a long time. But you can collect hundreds, even thousands of bees in a bee bank and then you can keep them in that structure. Um, if you have to move, often you have to move the hive. So you take the hive and the bees in the bee vac container to a location and then um, either tap them into the box or you can tap them into the, uh, around the front of the box and, and, and they should all go in. Let, let's um, talk now about adduction or budding. Uh, it's obviously a, a more subtle process in propagating the hive, but in my experience, uh, and certainly with Australis, uh, say comparing Australis to uh, Cabanara, Australis react in a budding sense with a new hive, certainly differently to say Cabanara. Is that your experience? Um, Glenn, to be 100% honest with you, I've never budded an Australis. I've never tried. Well, sorry for budding in. While you're talking about budding, I'll just bring up a screen share. Is in a bud situation at the moment. This section here, hopefully you can see, is, is the brood that's been transferred across. And as I take it, these are honey pots and pollen pots. Yes. You'll see here in the, the screen that it has brewed, but it looks like it's discolored for some reason. Well, that brood to me looks like it's pupil brood. You can see the eyes of the, the pupae. Yep. yep. Yeah, you can see the eyes of the pupae through that. So that, that was the brood um, that you transferred in, right? Yep. So it's what um, we might call an assisted bud uh, right. or an assisted adduction. Mm -hmm. So in, a, in, a, in an unassisted adduction, you simply connect the two boxes together. In an assisted one, you add to the, uh, the bud box um, brood, which could be from the mother colony or could be from another colony. Yeah. And that's what you've done, right? Yep. So that, um, that brood looks like it's maturing and um, the bees hopefully will emerge um, soon, sooner rather than later. Uh, and they will uh, add to the population. So that, whether whether that will suit, so if there's a queen 
if there was a queen cell? Do you, do you recall whether there was a queen cell in that brood that you Look, moved over? I, I thought there was a queen cell, but being an Australis, it's so difficult to work out whether it's a queen cell or it's, or it's not a queen cell. So in my, as being a new beekeeper, it was difficult for me to work. I thought I did, but um, not sure. Sure, yeah, okay. So um, if there was a queen cell in there, then that kind of gives the opportunity when that queen emerges, a virgin queen, that can stimulate um, a, a more quick um, development of a brood chamber and a queen. The queen emerges, she releases her pheromones, the, yep. the, the, uh, the nurse bees look after her and they may let her go on a mating flight and come back and take over as a, a mated queen in that bud box, that daughter colony. Yeah. Uh, whether that's going to happen in your case, I, I don't know. Um, as you say, in the case of Australis, the queen cells can be hidden and it's hard to determine. In the case of Carbonaria, it's usually very easy because you got these beautiful flat sheets yeah. of comb with yeah. the queen cells on the outside so you can be pretty sure that you're taking over a queen or two when you when you do an assisted bud. But in the case of Australis, with that cluster like a bunch of grapes, imagine trying to find a you know, yeah. a grape, um, with one particular grape within a bunch of grapes. You can't really get between the, the the grapes to get into the inside to see if there's a queen cell present. So, and one um, sorry, one thing, that I, sorry, one thing that I have found too though is that um, they very quickly develop stores in the daughter hive, but um, the the as you say, the assistance of putting brood in there was a later because. It just took forever and a day uh, to even get to that stage. So it is a very slow process with Australis. Yes, and they're all different. Sometimes, um, they, well, I'm not talking specifically about Australis now. Yep. Uh, so if your question's about Australis, I'd probably give you a different answer. But if yep. it's just budding in general or adduction, yes. I should say adduction, that's the more common term for it. Um, adduction in general is they're all different so in yep. one case the experience is yes you get lots of food sometimes the whole box is full of food but no brood yep in other cases uh, you get brood and no food and I like to tell a story of one season when I did um, three adductions just at, at my own home and I got one that filled with food and no brood one that filled with brood and no food and the other one that did nothing whatsoever. Sorry, Tim, I'm just bringing up a screen share to get another photo. So the one that filled with brood and minimal food, I thought, well, okay, it's probably going to be viable. I'll separate it now. Um, and it actually died. So it, there was not enough brood there for a viable, you know, for a colony to be viable in the, in the long term. There just wasn't the population to collect food and guard the box. So yep. that was not a success. Yeah. Um, the one that had a lot of, uh, the, the, where they didn't fill anything in the box, clearly that wasn't a success. Yeah. And the third one where they had put food but no brood, I assisted that one, put brood in, and that ultimately was a success. So the only one that succeeded was the one that required, that I had to intervene into. So, yeah. you know, one out of three and it needed intervention. So that's kind of my experience with adduction. But, I, I you know, I don't want to tell people what to do. Other people have great success with adduction, mm. but um, um, yeah, that, that's that, that. My experience is that the, the it's is highly variable what happens, mm. and it requires a lot of intervention, a lot of um, constant management, and um, and and a lot of a lot of failures, which yeah. I don't have splitting. I, my, my splitting success rate is very high. But, you know, that's my experience. Other people have different experiences and I completely respect um, different differences of opinion. Yeah. So, so in, in essence, if, if you're gentle enough with trying to propagate under a splitting method, then really that that's the way that could, you could go about it and, and achieve the aim of, of um, a good, healthy hive at the end of the day. Well, look, Glenn, I recommend that everyone has a go at both techniques and make up their own mind and, you know, learn as much as they can, talk to as many people as they can. Don't have a closed mind about either technique. Try them. 
try them all. Maybe budding is the best way to go first up and see if you have success with that. If you don't have success with budding, then you've got a box there, usually with some kind of resources in it, some stores that you can then use for splitting. Yeah, sure. And, and some people use that as a technique. There's various hybrids of a budding and, um, and standard hard splitting that are emerging now, yeah. which um, work very well for some people. Some people bud up for a while, get their, get what the, get that box, that bud box all nicely propolized inside and all the gaps filled and, um, and the entrance made up. And then they use that box to split with. Yeah, sure. Well, Tim, one of the other questions I've got regarding entries, and you'll see on the screen that I, this is one that I've, I've used on one of my boxes, which is a, just a, a PVC entry. Um, I, I put it that size because I can then use a another piece of PV to slot over the end to have a gauze just in case I want to shift them. But it's not detrimental to have entries like that on hives as opposed to just the normal hole in the box where they enter from? No, I don't think it's detrimental at all. I mean, what you, I can see an advantage of it and I can't really see any disadvantage. I mean, the bees... You know, very are very good at flying in and out. Sometimes they miss, and if it's on a if it's a flat, you know, flat entry is flush with the outside of the box, it's probably a bit easier for them to get in if they land on the outside of the. Um, but no, look, I, I can't see any problem with that at all. And I guess the advantage is that you're providing them with kind of the equivalent of the defensive internal entrance tube that they build themselves with time. You're providing yep. that right up front. So yeah, you're putting an entrance tube in place straight up. Um, positioning of hives. Some say that you know they're orientated to to the northeast or the a similar direction. Is is that a big factor? I don't believe it is, Glenn. I mean, honey beekeepers talk about this a lot, and I accept that for honey bees it is. I have plenty of locations where I uh, keep a, a number of hives, and often you know four is a pretty common number of hives that I keep. In, and, and quite often they're orientated in, in four different directions or many, several different directions anyway. And I, I visit them every nine months and I don't see any sort of patterns there. I don't see that the ones that are facing west or north or east or any direction do better or worse than any others. I think the ideal position in winter is probably not the ideal position in summer in most cases. Um, so I think it kind of, there's a bit of an evening out, you know, you'll get a position that's nice and warm in winter and that does well in winter, but in summer it's a bit hot. So maybe they don't do so well and, and then vice versa. So yep. they even themselves out over a season and you get pretty similar performance facing any direction in my experience. Finally, movement of hives. Tell us about how we should go about moving hives uh, if, if we want to change locations. Yeah, so if you're moving a hive from A to B, you mean, you're not talking about moving a daughter hive after a split or a bud? Yep, moving from, uh, let, let's say you've got a, a position in summer that's good, but not good in winter and vice versa, and you want to change that on a property. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so stepping is one way, and uh, that can be very good for changing from a winter to a summer position. Sometimes you only need to move the hive a short distance, and stepping is well suited to that that, um, that situation. So by stepping, I mean you're just moving the hive a short distance, the equivalent of one human step um, per day um, for as long as it takes to move it into the new position. And um, yeah, that, that's certainly a, a, a method that many people use. But if you do say you need to move them from the front fence down to the back fence and it's 40 metres away and um, stepping was going to take you, you know, months to do, then... Um, what you have to do then is um, wait till night. So if you're stepping, it doesn't matter what time of day you do it. You don't need to close the hive. You can just step them day, night, doesn't matter. But if you do need to move them longer distances, you have to wait till night. You have to close the hive and you have to move it with the bee, all the bees inside to a new location. That location needs to be at least a kilometre away and you need to keep them there for at least three weeks. And then, uh, then after that, you can take them to the new position in the uh, back in the in, in your yard or wherever it is, um, and they'll have forgotten the landscape by then. Well, it's not so much the, the hive as collective has forgotten it because the individual bees 
have turned over by then. They've been a whole new suite of cohort of bees um, foraging from the hive by then. And so they've forgotten the old position and they'll, they won't get confused and go back to it. Tim, I really appreciate uh, your sharing of information. Um, this has been certainly a wealth of, uh, of beekeeping expertise that you've had over, as I say, for 30 odd years. I appreciate your time and uh, I'm sure many others who are going to watch this video will, uh, will appreciate the experience that you provide them um, and look forward to talking to you again. I'll put all your details in the book and uh, that'll be all at the end of the video. So really appreciate your time and thanks very much. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure.